Lee Marsh has a wonderful question. How did you learn to build models from concept art? This is a terrific question. Would you see in the bathroom if one of those Nilo, Rodas, Jamiro? Yeah. Um, building models from concept art. That is a very specific thing. Now I'm assuming you are meaning the terms under which I learned how to do it, which was on the job. Which means that an art director like Peter Rubin or Alex Laurent or Doug Chang handed me a drawing. Yeah, and I used to work for Nilo Rodas Gemero, worked for Lucasfilm doing project, project and uh, prop and vehicle design since Empire. And I worked with Nilo on uh, Home Alone 3, a masterpiece. Um, and so this is the kind of, this is what we mean by concept art. This is the kind of stuff that Nilo or Joe Johnston would turn around back in the early days of Star Wars. And then model makers like Steve Gawley and Lauren Peterson would interpret that. And the trick is, the trick to making something from concept art on the job is not to get lost in the weeds and not to lose sight of the forest for the trees. By that I mean you could look at this and you could make a copy of it and lay it out as an elevation and slavishly replicate it perfectly in this orientation. But I would submit that that's not quite doing the job because this is a, that's a 2D approach to a 2D piece of artwork. But this is a 2D representation of a 3D thing. So my job as a model maker with a piece of concept art like this is to interpret, the art director is telling me a whole bunch of, inf the art director is telling me more information than is in this drawing. In the topological details he's shading and calling out and then their orientation to each other, he's telling me about all of the aesthetics of this vehicle, including the parts I can't see. So my job as a model maker is to art direct the rest of what I can't see here so that it feels like what I can see. And when I do that and show it to the art director and, and I've gotten it right, they're like, good job. But they also might look at it and see, okay, here, you know, we need a little thing over here. And um, yeah, it's a process, but it's not just about copying what's here in the drawing. It's about interpreting what's here in the drawing and feeding that interpretation back through what's possible and what looks right. And it may be, I mean, I've built things in a drawing that I realized didn't quite look right once you saw them in 3D space and I had to, I modified them. Like that, that's totally part of what your job is. And this is, I mean, this is one of the things I love about the film industry, right? Because everybody, the job of production designer doesn't end with the production designer, just as the same way as the job of storytelling doesn't end with a begin and end with a director. Each of them is the, the apex of the pyramid that they're managing, but everyone below them is also an art director and a production designer and a storyteller and a director. And when it's cracking on all cylinders, when it's crackling along on all cylinders, everybody is bringing their their aesthetic interpretation to help push the story forward. I asked Guillermo del Toro once, I, he had just given me a tour through the art department of Pacific Rim, and I was looking at all of these people and I'm like, how do you keep all of these people aligned towards a singular goal when there's like 70 of them? And he said, you have to give everyone total autonomy within a tiny bandwidth, which is one of the great management descriptions I have ever heard. That is exactly right. Ownership over what you're doing, but bound it. And your job as a model maker is to understand what those boundaries really are. And sometimes you have to push past them, or sometimes you need to bring the art director in and say, this didn't work the way you drew it. And I need some guidance as to how, here's three options. Tell me which one is working the way you'd like it to work. Um, Building from concept art and working with an art director or production designer who is uh, game to play is one of the great pleasures of making for a living. Seriously, like on episodes one and two, Doug Chang would come through uh, every few days and sort of see how you were doing and then give you some more things to try and give you some other things to execute. So much fun. Um, my, my, my interactions with Peter Rubin on Terminator 3 and on, on Space Cowboys were so 
deeply satisfying. When an art director or production designer knows that they can trust you, they give you more stuff to do and you get a lot more, you get a lot more freedom to kind of like stretch your wings. It's the best. Um, let's see here. Hmm. Uncouth J asks an interesting question. Uh, they say, we have a movie studio being built nearby. What kind of things might prop departments look to outsource to local makers? I have wood and metal lathes and ancillary machinery and tools. That's an interesting question. So I'm assuming by your question, it is implied that you would like to get overflow work from this movie studio. Uh, and you would like to be executing that overflow work in your nearby shop. I would tell you that in film, that kind of work uh, would frequently come with a very, very tight timeline. So if you wanted to be that kind of job shop, you should be ready to execute something in a day or a few hours, because that's where a, a film studio would be looking to get something done if they're starting to reach out. But it is a very reasonable thing to go to the folks that are working in the studio and say, hey, nearby, I've got a shop where if you need some large piece of metal laid down or machined down, I can do it. That's a terrific thing to offer. But I will tell you that when they call you, I'm getting guessed that for the most part, they're gonna call you with timelines that are egregious, which means that they know they're gonna have to spend. Like when you're an art, when you are working on a project and you're calling someone and saying, I need something in a day, you are telling them you are ready to pay double, at least because when you need something on a very tight timeline, you, you're gonna have to pay for that. Um, if you were going to show them some portion of your work to show them what you can do on your machines, my recommendation would be to make something that they already know what it should look like. That tells them that you can replicate, that tells them that you can make something to their specs, right? So if you make some art piece, well, they don't know how long that took you. They don't know who designed it. They don't know how you interpreted what drawing. But if you make something like a you know, quarter scale car engine block, I'm not saying that that's what you should make, but like people know what that should look like. And if you make one and it does look like that, well, they know that you got it right. Uh, interesting question. That's, I, I, I like looking at alternative revenue streams, especially when you have a shop and you can use it. Years and years and years ago, I loaded a uh, piece of specialty equipment into the Los Alamos labs up on the Mesa uh, in New Mexico. And, and uh, as such, I was working with an early satellite reconnaissance expert who had, if I remember correctly, he had worked on the team that built the camera that photographed the Bay of Pigs. Yeah, yeah, this guy had seen some things. And I asked him, we were driving to the location one day and I was like, hey, when the CIA, cause he had had inroads with the various three lettered agencies. I said, hey, when the CIA builds like a camera into a pack of cigarettes, do they have their own shop? And he was like, nope. I've just realized I never told this story publicly before. Yeah, he said, no, they don't. And I said, who do they contract to? And he said, they find some guy with a little garage shop, they contract it out. And I was like, I've got a little garage shop. And he literally, literally, I'm not exaggerating any of this dialogue at all. You're me, I'm sitting in the passenger seat, he's driving and he literally like, er, he stops. And he turns to me and he's like, you don't wanna work for the spook, son. And I'm like, okay. And he's like, I worked for them in the 60s and they tapped my phones for like 20 years. Like they keep tabs. I guess I understand that. And he was like, yeah, you don't want that. And I agree, I don't want that. <laughs> so alternative revenue streams within reason. Thank you so much for watching. If you'd like to support us even further, you can by becoming a tested member. Uh, details are of course below, but it includes all sorts of perks and we're building them all the time. You get advanced word and behind the scenes photos of some of our projects questions, you get to ask direct questions during my live streams, and we have some members only videos, including the Adam real-time series of unbroken, unedited shots of me working here in the shop. They are 
weirdly meditative. Thank you guys so much. I'll see you on the next one.